I'm not going to talk about fried chicken. I'm not going to talk about onion soup or McDonald's. There will be no food analogies in this video. What I am going to talk about is the Monte SkyQuest GMT. Let's dive in. Watches are fascinating. A group of horse that cost three or four hundred thousand dollars is a literal work of art. Everything is as close to handmade as you can possibly get. Each component is either cut, shaped, molded, polished, or engraved by a watchmaker with some kind of tool in their hand. There's no robot that follows a set of instructions going through the motions from A to B until the case or dial has the shape, texture, and details that the manufacturer is aiming for. The number of watchmakers that put that level of work into their watches is tiny. Once you get to a company making much more than a couple of hundred watches a year, you can rest assured that a machine and a computer are needed to produce at scale. Grubel Forsey made somewhere around 300, 350 watches last year. They are 120 people. Not all of those people are watchmakers. Some of them are certainly in finance and HR, but the ratio of employees to watches comes down to 40%. Do the same math for Patek Philippe or Audemars Piguet, and the ratio drops to less than 5%. You can't make the inference that the relationship is linear. Patek and AP obviously have a lot of people employed to market their watches and man their stores, but it's not unreasonable to assume that Patek puts less man hours into each watch than Grubel Fosse does. We all know that there are one or two Pateks and APs that have machine stamped dials and other components are possibly sourced from China. Watches by SJX has an interesting article from 2022 that discusses how many hours actually go into building a watch. Grubel Forse are at the absolute upper end with most watches taking 300 hours or more with their fully handmade model taking 6,000 man hours. Now Patek on the other hand, they spend between 30 and 100 hours per watch on average. The point I'm making is that the in-house handmade watch is more or less a myth. Those watches, like the Grubel Forse handmade, make up less than 1% of 1% of all watches made. Everything else is to a greater or lesser extent built with the use of machines. To me, this is a fascinating little factoid because a lot about luxury watches is predicated on the storytelling about watchmaking craft, about in-house movements, about honorable watchmakers slaving over intricate movements with that little you know, magnifying glass over their eye. The storytelling about watchmaking in part wants us to believe in this noble art of watchmaking. But you don't have to go further down than Rolex or Tudor. They quite literally do almost none of that. Watch the Tudor video about how their new production facility is automated and digitized, and you'll clearly see that there is very little craft in their watchmaking. Rolex is similar. They are first and foremost experts at one thing, and that is high quality manufacturing. Rolex is in many ways completely soulless compared to someone like Grubel Forse. Rolex watches are incredibly robust, they're precise, they are impeccably made, and the diamonds are hand placed and there are hands that go into this, but a robot was involved from start to finish. And then you have watches at $1,000, $2,000, $3,000. This is the space where brands don't really manufacture their watches. This is where the dreaded word sourcing comes massively into play. Parts are sourced from China, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the watch is practically just assembled in Switzerland so a company can throw on the Swiss made logo. A lot of people are going to question if that's even worthy of being categorized as watchmaking because it takes on such a different shape compared to the Grubel Forsey and even the Rolex. And this is where we get to Monta. The Monta SkyQuest GMT costs around $2,500. For that money, you get a 40.7 millimeter case with 11.8 millimeters of thickness. The lug width is 20 millimeters and the lug to lug is 47.4 millimeters. You get 300 meters of water resistance. The power reserve is 56 hours from the Monta Caliber M23, which is a spec out version of the Celita SW330. There's an aluminum bezel insert. The crystal has anti-reflective coating on the underside. The dial features applied hour markers with full rhodium surrounds that are filled with BGW9 Swiss Superluminova. The hands are also rhodium plated, sword style hands filled with Superluminova as well. The dials matte black on the model I have with the small touches of red on the GMT hand and for the SkyQuest text at six o'clock. As for the bracelet, Monta doesn't exactly go the humble route and they claim it's the most comfortable watch bracelet on the planet. That obviously is for someone else to decide, but it is an oyster style bracelet with a fully milled clasp, micro adjustments, and all the modern bells and whistles. Monta, for context, are a relatively new brand. They aren't a legacy brand that have been around for 50, 100, or 200 years. They were started by the same people behind Everest watch bands, and it shows. 
If you know anything about Everest, it's that for the bands, they are of a very high quality, and for that quality, you usually pay quite a premium. Some people think it's a bit much for a rubber strap with custom fit for your Submariner or your Tudor, where others think that the premium is worth every single penny. It's kind of the same story with Monta. Everything about this watch is produced to a incredibly high standard. The bracelet is ridiculously solid. The micro adjustment is also solid and fluid. The clasp itself has some of the tightest tolerances I've ever experienced. There's no play where you might see it on something like a Seiko bracelet or an Oris bracelet. The polishing of the case is really well done. The dial looks premium. The bezel has a solid click to it at every turn and everything is perfectly aligned. The movement's smooth. You don't hear that scratchy, scratchy sound you sometimes hear from movements around this price point. Is it Rolex level manufacturing? Of course not. The Monta bracelet has no play, but it's almost too tight. You need a little bit more finger dexterity on the Monta. The tightness almost works against it. Same goes for something like the bezel. The bezel knurling is a little bit on the sharp side, almost as if it's unfinished, but it is incredibly consistently cut and shaped. Same goes for most other components. It's not the right kind of GMT movement, but on a lot of those externals, you will be astounded by how close this watch gets to something like a Longines or a Tudor. The reason I make those comparisons, which some people might find a little bit silly, is because of the effect of how watch manufacturing has been democratized. It's wild how much you get for your money at this price point these days, which brings me back to those expectations we have to Kribbel Forse, Patek, Rolex, and all the others. How do they do that? Grubel Forse is largely handmade. It, Patek is very handmade, but not completely. Rolex is machine built in-house from end to end. In this price range where you see Christopher Ward, Yema, Formex, Monta, and Ordain, and a whole lot of others, you don't get anything that is fully handmade or even fully manufactured in-house. You don't get any company where they have full control of the supply chain. Anodane makes their own dials, but the movements are sourced. Yema has developed their own manufacture, but other components are sourced. Christopher Ward sources Celita. Formex sources their movements. Monta sources their movements. This is a space where everybody is competing on the same playing field. Nobody has the money to do everything in-house, so your job as a manufacturer is to be good at sourcing and assembling the things you need. Whether you are Christopher Ward or Monta, what you do is you design a watch and then you get to work. Where do you find a bracelet that matches the specs you want at that price you want? Where do you find the movement you want at that price you want? Where do you find the bezel mechanism you want at that price you want? Where do you find the base dial you want at the price you want? What details, if any, do you want to do yourself and what will that cost? You start with figuring out what you want to sell your watch for. You decide you want to sell your watch for $2,500, $1,500, or $1,000, and you mix and match the components until you get a quality that you believe will match people's expectations at the price and will net you the profit that you're looking for. If you want to offer people a milled clasp with micro adjustments, you're likely closer to $2,000 than $1,000. If you want a cost level Celita movement over a non cost movement, you're closer to $1,500 than $1,000. If you want a bezel action that has no play and is perfectly aligned, the price gets closer to $2,000. That's the name of the game to a large extent in this price range, which opens up three perspectives. Is this even watchmaking art? There's very little craft in this monitor in the way there is in a global forcing. This is not handmade. This is a sourcing exercise. The number of watchmaker man hours that go into a watch of this type has little to none of the romance associated with Gilbert Forsey or Roger Smith. The bracelet maybe comes from China, the Salita movement is specced to Monta standards, but it's a ubiquitous movement that you find in a million other watches. And if you're looking for the romance of watchmaking, this isn't it. But that Rolex is barely romantic either. Neither is the Tudor, and in this space of Monta, Christopher Ward, and Formex, sourcing and supply chain management is the name of the game. There's not a ton of romance here, and if you're a cynic, you won't like the watches in this price point. But for me, the reality is that it just takes the manufacturing out of the equation. Monta does do some R&D in terms of different components, and that does translate into high demands towards their sub-vendors and their manufacturers. But it doesn't change the fact that Monta are mainly designing, specking, and assembling. The manufacturing is not at the core of what they do. What you have is a very well put together watch from Monta, where you largely make your decision based on the aesthetic, the design, the look, because everything else is going to be pretty darn good in this space. You really have to be cynical not to appreciate the work that goes into making this watch. Sure, it's not handmade, 
Yes, it's sourced to some extent from China or wherever, but there is still effort that went into putting it together. It's just a different type of effort, and it's an effort that allows some people that can't afford a good before, say, like myself, to get something that is still really, really good. Second question, is the Monta worth it at this price point? Worth it is always a very, very difficult question to answer. What is worth it for me is not necessarily worth it for you. Monta's in this hyper-competitive space that spans Seiko's for $1,500, Christopher Ward's for $1,500, and Formex watches for about the same as the Monta. And for $500 more, you get a Longines. In previous videos, I've often stated that from $1,000 to $6,000-ish, for every dollar the price goes up, there's a corresponding increase in quality. Above that point, marketing costs, gold markers, and brand value really skew that relationship. There are some places where you can tell that Monte is asking more of their suppliers than some others in this price point. When you're sourcing, you are usually buying off the shelf. That means the watch brand, for example, goes to the bracelet manufacturer and asks for a bracelet of a certain quality with you know, certain technical characteristics. Depending on the specs the brand wants, the manufacturer pulls down the model they have off the shelf and say, this is the one that most closely matches your specs. If the brand like Monta wants to change or make improvements, they either have to consider if they have the capability to do that in-house, that could be polishing or chamfering or other things that fall into the finishing category, or they have to pay extra to the manufacturer to make a bespoke model. That's usually going to drive up the cost significantly, either on a per bracelet price in the specific example, or the manufacturer will tell the brand that they can only do those specs at some minimum volume. For all those reasons, what you start to see, for the most part, is watches converging on largely the same price points with largely the same features and largely the same quality. The incentive to go above and beyond on a certain quality is not really there because your watch is going to get too expensive to sell because neither Monta nor Christopher Ward or even Oris are going to sell 500,000 of any given watch. But Monta have, in what I think is in most areas, gone for the highest spec possible and openly state in interviews that they, in some places, have set higher standards for the components they need. In those same interviews, they admit that not all manufacturers could do what they wanted for the price at those relatively small volumes that Monta needed, but Monta still does it. Those demands to those sub-vendors do drive up the price, both in terms of the pre-work or the R&D that Monta put into their specs, but it's also in the price those manufacturers will charge for those adjustments to the core baseline specs. Monta have basically pushed the limit of what you can source. The Salita is likely one of the best movements they can get their hands on. If they could source a Kinesi movement, I'm sure they would. The bracelet is likely the best they can source. The bezel action, bezel insert, all of them are to a very high standard. Monta comes across as having splurged on the high-end parts all the way around, which of course shows in the price. Overall, I do personally feel that this translates into a watch that is overall better put together than other offerings that cost a bit less. But I also get the feeling that where Christopher Ward have leaned heavily into branding that balances affordability and price, Monta leans more into talking about quality. Monta definitely wants you to pay a premium for that extra bit of quality. Everest bands are very, very good, but they are definitely priced at a premium because that band is going onto your Rolex and Everest are banking on you being willing to pay a little premium for something that is seemingly bespoke. Monta wants you to think in a similar way about their watches. So Monta has put themselves in an interesting position. To me, my personal opinion is that the watch feels of a better quality than something comparable from CW or Zelos or Doxa, but they are definitely charging a premium. Monta is close to something you get from Longines, but costs less than the Longines. Hi guys, Mike here. I am in Geneva at Watches and Wonders. Well, I'm in my hotel room and I just got back from looking at a lot of watches, including the Tudor Black Bay GMT. And I had two thoughts that I wanted to include in this Monta video. The two thoughts are going to be in different spaces in the video, so I'm going to pop up a little bit later in the video again. After looking at the Tudor Black Bay GMT, there's no doubt that the Tudor is a better watch. I make the case for Monta and a lot of other brands in this price bracket for being of an incredibly high quality, and I definitely stand by that. Having spent some time with Tudor watches today, I'll say the following in comparison with the Monta. Bracelets are pretty much the same. There's not a whole lot of difference, and that's not where you're going to see the difference. When it comes down to case finishing, it's also pretty much the same. The designs are different. 
but the finishing in terms of polish and so on is very, very comparable. The place where the Tudor pulls ahead is in three places. One is the bezel, which is the bezel knurling and the bezel action. That is a massive difference compared to what the Monte is capable of. Formex comes close to a Tudor, but the Monte doesn't. It's still incredibly good, it's incredibly tight, it's incredibly precise, but there's just something about the Tudor that feels better put together. Two, it's the dial. Plots, hands, markers, and just the dial in itself is just that step or two up on a Tudor compared to what you can get from a Monte. There's no, there's no question, no ifs, ands, or buts. Finally, it's the movement. There is no Salita movement that can compete with a Kinesi Metas movement. I think, honestly, Metas is overrated. I'm going to do a video on it because it's something that I've been thinking about for a while. Zero to five seconds is not necessary. Minus four to plus six is more than enough for me. 15,000 Gauss is about 14,999 Gauss more than the Earth produces. And a MagSafe charger on your phone is about 50 Gauss. So unless you're working around an MRI all day and then you're not going to have your watch on anyway because otherwise you're going to get sucked into the machine and get your arm ripped off or you're working at CERN, the vast majority of people do not need 15,000 Gauss protection. So a lot of the stuff that goes into Metas and there is a cost associated to getting a motor certification is translated into too much of a premium in regards to what you actually get as a consumer that is practically worthwhile. But having said that, the movement in the Tudor is head and shoulders, leagues ahead of anything you get in the sub $2,500 space. And nobody below $2,500 can do it anywhere close. I know it's a little bit of an oversimplified comparison, but you can either see that positioning as a strong differentiator, you know, pay a little more and you get better quality or save some money and get something that is close to as good as a long jeans in many ways, but not always. That's the positive view. The negative, you're overpaying for something that is only a little bit better than the CW, or you're cheaping out on getting a long jean that overall is likely just that tad better. Monta wants you to believe in the former. Whether that's worth it is up to you. And finally, is it special? If you've noticed something about the way I've talked about the watch, I've focused a lot on the specs. I haven't mentioned the look of the watch that much. There's a reason for that. I can drool over Grubel Force, but I can't afford one. Not unless I sell the house at least, and my family is probably going to think that's a little bit drastic. Do I drool over this watch? No, not really. I have to reiterate this. I think this watch from a quality and production perspective is worth every penny. Others might not. Others will feel that they are charging just a bit much. But for me, on pure quality, 2400 is perfectly fine. However, looks-wise in this space, I demand more from the design. Simply because production standards and quality levels and innards are so similar, the watch itself needs to stand out in some way. And that, to some extent, is the problem for me with this space sometimes. Already by now, I should have made my case for how a lot of brands in the space converge on the same production model. They get the same parts, they source in the same way, and then they kind of try to figure out what price point they want to be at. But another thing also happens, which isn't a criticism, it's just a statement of fact. That is, manufacturers converge on very similar design conventions as well. To me, a Hydro Conquest GMT, a Monta SkyQuest, a Sealander GMT, and even a Formex GMT inhabit a very similar safe space. They inhabit a similar space to the Tudor Black Bay GMT or the Rolex GMT. And I'm back. Second point. I am talking about design conventions and how they tend to converge in the space. And all I just wanted to do was put the Monta next to the new Tudor Black Bay GMT because it's just so bleeding obvious how much the convergence is. There's all sorts of historical reasons for that. And this is just another example of this convergence on what people expect and what people are looking for. It's so rare that you find a brand that chooses to buck the convention. The safe bit is to converge on those safe design conventions. And now back to the video. They are these, relatively speaking, middle-of-the-road, broadly appealing standard GMTs. 
Most people don't want something shaped like a Panerai or a Doxa or Seiko Willard. Most people will gravitate to those regular design conventions. And for that simple reason, manufacturers will produce their variations on that very same theme. The Monta has the Rolex style bezel. The Monta has the Oyster style case. It has also the Oyster style bracelet. The Monta has the classic differently colored GMT hand like a Hydro Conquest has, like a Rolex has, like a Christopher Ward has. The watch is a variation on a theme. And because I'm a watch enthusiast, I already have a watch that inhabits that space. For me, it's the Tudor GMT. There's no unfilled space in my collection for a watch like this. But if that space was there, would it be in contention? Yes, I'd likely choose it over a Hydro Conquest. I'd personally probably pay extra over the Christopher Ward. And if the Tudor didn't exist, well, I might choose the Monta, but it would have heavy competition with something like a Longines Spirit Zulu Time. The aesthetics are very nice. They're just a lot like what a lot of others also offer. Monta have made a solid premium watch where to me at least you get incredibly high quality. It's not art, it's not high horology, but it's proof that big brands cannot unequivocally make the claim that their watches are leagues ahead of the space in terms of general quality. It's also an example, not a unique one, but an example of how good a watch you can get these days for less than $2,500. You can source your way to a ridiculously good watch these days, and brands like Tudor, Longines, and all those other Maisons have to stay vigilant. They don't have as clear a competitive advantage in terms of core product compared to brands like Monta, Formex, and Zodiac these days. The gap hasn't closed, but it has narrowed for sure. At least, that's what I think. What do you think? Like, subscribe. Cheers.